Hello, this is Professor Gregor again. Um, this lecture is on Chapter 2, Probability Concepts and Applications. This could be easily a two-week um, standalone section of the course, but uh, it's not. And we need to know some probability concepts, even though this is not a probability and stats course. Um, we're going to be covering all of these sexual sections through 211, which is the normal uh, distribution. You will have problems on some simple probability, but you'll also have uh, problems on some conditional probability assignments, and one binomial and one normal uh, in distribution problem in your homework this week. And it's really sipping from a fire hose. Uh, we probably need a graduate course in probability and statistics, but we don't have one, so this is it. Um, probability has to do with uncertainty. Life is uncertain. We don't know what the future will bring, even though we try to forecast the future all the time, but we're always forecasting um, and uh, the unknown. Uh, weather forecasting, sales forecasting, it's all the same. We assume the immediate past uh, will dictate what the immediate future will look like. So probability is a numerical statement about the likelihood that an event will occur. What percent of the time, what number of trials would you expect it to happen? Probabilities are, between, are represented as numbers between 0 and 1 if they're decimal. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, etc. It could be several decimal places long. Um, my stance on decimal places is we don't usually need decimal places beyond two or three unless we're flying rocket ships to the moon or Mars and that eighth decimal place is the difference between a safe landing on that distant planet or singing the Major Tom song. Um, we can also express probabilities as percentages or fractions. The fractions have to be between 0 and 1. So the numerator has to be no larger than the denominator for that to occur. And all decimals can be expressed as a uh, percentage, uh, an equivalent percentage. 30, 0.3 is 30%, 0.5 is 50%, etc. And if you have a countable number of events that determine a probability. All the probabilities have to add up to one. Um, here's the chapters in the book in which probability is important. We talk about it in decision analysis next week, in forecasting and regression models a few weeks after that, in inventory control models after that, and then that's the last time we're going to talk about it, even though we could cover the rest of these chapters. And then, of course, uh, if we were to do decision theory in a normal distribution or game theory, but we're not doing any of those. So here's a very simple problem, or a very simple example. Demand for white latex paint at this company has always been either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 gallons per day. That's all they sell. I don't know how a business, maybe if they're a paint store, could um, survive on selling four cans of white paint a day, but that's okay. Over the past 200 days, the owner has observed the quantity demanded, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is this 1, 2, 3, 4. And here's the numbers. Uh, number of days they sold 0 is 40. Number of days they sold uh, 1 was 80, etc. And it adds up to 200, which is what they said they collected the data over. So we now want to know what's the percentage of time that they sold 0. Well, it's 40 over 200, or 0.2, or 20%. How many times did they sell one? It, one can only. It's 80 divided by 200. So it's, it's the observation divided by the sample size, in this case, 200. Uh, and that's 0.4, or 40%, and et cetera. If we had the probabilities up, they come to 1. Now, if I tell you that, if I gave you just the first two columns, you would think about this and say, well, um, basically, okay, these are some statistics on how paint sold, how many cans of white latex paint they sold 
uh, per day, and here's their occurrence. But as soon as I make it a probability or a percentage, um, we can say that 20% of the time we sell zero. We extrapolate it to a universal. Uh, how many times do we sell two cans of paint? Well, 25% of the days we do that. I'm really interested. I'd like to sell four cans of white latex paint every day. How often does that happen? Oh, only 5% of the time. So I notice the individual probabilities are between 0 and 1. They all add up to 1, etc. Um, so when we talk about this kind of objective probability, we talk about a relative frequency or the percentage of time that we've observed something happens. And it's the number of occurrences of a specific event divided by the total number of outcomes. We see that 40 days out of 200, we had zero cans of white paint sold. So it's 40, the particular event we're interested in, zero cans sold, divided by the total number of events, which was the number of days, which is 200. The classical or logical method is you determine the probabilities without trials. We all assume that if I flip a coin, um, there's only one way to get ahead and there's two possibilities. Assuming it's a fair coin, uh, the probability is going to be one half, which is represented as a fraction, 0.5 as a decimal, or 50% as a percentage. Uh, subjective probability is based on experience and judgment of the person making the estimate. We have opinion polls, judgment of experts, something called the Delphi method. We're not going to get into any of that because it's not a class in surveying. But, you know, we take a small percentage of the United States population, see who they're going to vote for president, and then tell us nationally it looks like candidate A is ahead of candidate B by so many points. Um, now we have this idea of mutually exclusive events. And we're talking about all these probabilities we're talking about here are things that we can count. Rolls of dice, flips of coins, uh, drawing cards from a deck. Events are said to be mutually exclusive if only one of the events can occur on any one trial. So tossing a coin will result in either a head or a ta tail. You can't get both. It's not going to stand on its edge. You can't get both a head and tail. They're mutually exclusive events. Rolling a die. Now notice they use the singular. Dice is plural. They show two, they show a pair here of die or dice, but a die is a single one. The only people that use the word die are probability instructors and statisticians. So rolling a die will result in only one of six possible outcomes. I don't know when's the last time you played a board game that had only one dice, and here I'm saying it wrong. But you, you, it, and if you did, you, you probably never experienced getting a two and a three simultaneously. So they're mutually exclusive events. If we're talking about the roll of a die, uh, and we assume it's a fair die, here is the outcomes: one, two, three, four, five, six, and each of them occurs equally, which means out of the six events. We can roll a one one way out of six different outcomes. We can roll a two. This is the logical uh, assignment of probabilities. A two one way out of six possible outcomes. So each of them is one six, and it adds up to a total of one. If we draw one card from a deck of 52 playing cards, it's different. Remember, playing cards have 52 cards, four suits of 13 each, which are hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs, and um, two different colors, red and black. Hearts and diamonds are red, spades and uh, clubs are black. So what's, how many ways can we draw a seven? Well, there's four sevens in a deck, one of each suit, out of 52, one of 13 ways. Drawing a heart there's 13 ways of drawing a heart because there's 13 of them out of 52 or one fourth. These two events are not mutually exclusive because the seven of hearts is in the second one and it's in the first one. So if we look at this table, draw a spade and a club. 
if you're only drawing one card, you can't draw both. So they're mutually exclusive. But is it collectively exhaustive? So we talk about that. These two events are not collectively exhaustive since there are other cards in the decks besides seven and hearts. So a spades and a club's not collectively exhaustive because there are we're not considering any of the red cards. Draw a face card and a number card. Well, it's collectively exhaustive because every card is either a face card or a number card. And it's mutually exclusive because a number card is not a face card. The face cards are jack, queen, king. Everything, and an ace, some people consider ace a face card, but ace is really considered one. Draw ace and a three, mutually exclusive, can't draw them at the same time. But it's not collectively exhaustive because those, those are not the only two cards, kind of cards in a deck. Draw a club and a non-club. This is mutually exclusive because either a card, if I draw one, it's either a club or not a club. It can't be both simultaneously and it's mutually exclusive or collectively exhaustive, excuse me. I think I've been saying it wrong. Because all cards are covered in this scenario. Draw a five and a diamond. Okay, let's look at that. Um, they're not mutually exclusive because one of the four fives in the deck is the five of diamonds. So one, there's a five, there's an intersection of those two sets. So it's not mutually exclusive and it's neither collectively exhaustive because there's other cards in the deck besides diamonds and fives. Draw a red card and a diamond, not mutually exclusive. Uh, half the red cards are diamonds. And it's not collectively exhaustive because we're not counting any of the black cards. We often want to know when one or a second event will occur. Uh, when two events are mutually exclusive, the, the mutually exclusive, the law of addition is holds very nicely. The probability of event A or event B is the probability of event A plus the probability of event B. What's the probability of picking a spade or a club? Well, they're they're you can't. They're mutually exclusive as we've decided. So there's 13 out of 52 or one fourth um, probability of picking a spade. There's one fourth probability of picking a club. We add those two together. We get a one half probability of picking a black card, a spade or a club. And notice it's or. Or means and. Um, if the events, if I'm adding non-mutually exclusive events, I have to subtract out that part which is redundant. So let's say probability of a five or a diamond. Well, the probability of five is four out of 12, but one of those is a diamond. And the probability of picking a diamond is 13 out of 52. So if you add that up and got 17, out of 52, you would get the wrong answer because you've counted the five of diamonds twice. So they have to subtract out the probability of picking the five of diamonds because you actually it's included in both. So you subtract out one out of 52. So it comes out to be 16 over 52 or four over 13. And sometimes in, in cards, it's easier to re represent them as fractions because not all the fractions come out to nice uh, decimal places. They have repeating decimals and all that. So if we look at it this way, if events are mutually exclusive, I get one or the other. There's no overlap. I'm either got a club or I have a spade. But if they have an intersection, I could pick a five or I could pick a diamond. The part that's in both is the five of diamonds. Now we have this concept of independence, statistically independent. The occurrence of one event has no effect on the probability or occurrence of the other. Just a dozen. Here's, let's look at some examples. Your education and your income level. Well, there is some correlation there. They're, they're dependent events. Draw a jack of hearts from a 50, full 52 card deck or draw a jack of clubs from a full 52 card deck. They're independent because I, if I draw the jack the first time of hearts, it has no impact whether I do the second one. Um, 
people get this confused with the law of averages. We'll talk about that in a minute. The clubs win the National League pennant, and the clubs win the World Series. Of course, they're dependent events. You cannot win the World Series without winning the National League pennant. Uh, snow in Santiago, Chile, and rain in Tel Aviv, Israel. They are essentially independent events, even though you might be able to link El Nino or some other global weather trend to the two events, but let's consider them independent. So there's three types of probability. Simple probability is just a probability of a single event occurring. They call it marginal or simple. Joint is a probability that of two or more events occurring and is equal to the product, the joint probability. Probabil probability of A and B. That's how you would read this, A and B, as opposed to A or B, where you have addition, this becomes multiplication. So that could be the probability of A and a probability of B. Conditional probability is a probability of an event B, given that event A has occurred. Okay, what's the probability of the Cubs winning the pennant, given that they won a National League championship? Whatever the odds makers give for that. What is the probability, uh, and let's take the opposite of A. What is the probability of the Cubs winning the National or the World Series if they did not win the National League championship? Well, it would be zero, right? Because you have to have won the National League championship in order to have a chance to win the World Series. Or the probability of the event A given that the event B has occurred. So we use this, this straight line, and it reads, what's the, this is the probability of A and B. This is the probability of A occurring. This is the probability of A and B. This is the probability of B given that A has occurred. This is the conditional probability of A given that B has occurred. So we have conditional probability. The probability of tossing a six on the first roll of a die and two on the second roll of the die. Well, it's an and problem. So we can multiply it out. Tossing a six is one six. Tossing a two is one six. They're independent events. One does not influence the other, so this, this law holds very well. I get one out of 36, or 0 0.028, a, a 2.8% chance of that happening. A bucket contains three black balls and seven green balls. So these, are, these are typical problems. If it's a bucket, it's a hat, it's a sack, it's whatever. Draw a ball from the bucket and replace it, and then draw the second ball. Whenever you see these problems and you have replacement, you end up with individual, uh, you, you, you end up with independent events. If you do not replace it, um, it's a sign that it's uh, dependent or not independent events. The same applies to a deck of cards. If I have a deck of cards, I pull a card, I see what it is, I put it back, shuffle it, and pull another one. Those two draws in a row are independent. But if I take a card and hold it and then take a second card, it's dependent because the card that I picked the first time is no longer possible to pick the second time, and the probabilities switch somewhat. Because now there's only 51 decks of cards left in the deck, and the card and the, and the value and, and, and suit of the card that you picked is missing. So the probability of a black ball drawn on the first one. Well, there's 10 balls in total. Three of them are black, so if I reach my hand in, there's a 3 out of 10 chance that I will get a... Um, black ball, and so that's 0.3 or 30 percent. The probability of getting two green balls is what's the probability of getting a green ball? Well, there's seven green balls out of 10, so it's seven out of 10 or 0.7. And then since I'm putting the ball back, I get another 0.7, so I get 49. So let's look at it again. Um, why do we have the same slide twice? Draw a ball from the bucket, replace it, and draw a second ball. Well, the probability of a black ball drawn on the second draw, if the first draw is green, it's a conditional probability, but it's really just a probability of a black ball because it's the same as picking the black ball on a first try. It doesn't know it's a second try. 
and a probability of picking a green ball on the second try given a first try. This is where people think of the law of averages. Ooh, I, I, I roll 10, I, I flip a coin 10 times and I get 10 heads. What's the probability of getting a head on the 11th try? Well, it's 50-50. It's 50% 50 chance of that happening because they're independent events. If I stand at the beginning of that and ask what's the probability of flipping 11 heads in a row, it would be 1 half times 1 half 11 times or 1 over 2 to the 11th power. So that's a slightly different way of looking at it. The law of averages, uh, there's no such thing actually. Marginal probability of an event occurring is computed the same way. Calculating the conditional probabilities is slightly more complicated. Uh, the probability, of, if they're statistically dependent events, the probability of event A given that the event B has occurred is the probability of AB divided by the probability of B. So the joint probability of two events happening is the probability of B given A and then the probability of P given, or the probability of A occurring. And all I did was do a little algebra to get from here to here. So this is statistically dependent events. So now we're looking at this. There are seven white and uh, four white and um, assume we have an urn that contains 10 balls of the following descriptions. Four are white and lettered L. Two are white and numbered N. Three are yellow and lettered L. One is yellow and numbered N. Boy, this is a little confusing, uh, but that's okay. It's like a deck of cards, right? We have the colors, white and yellow, and we have uh, the suits. There's only two suits. Well, the L and N. So what's the probability of a white one and a lettered one? Uh, well, it's how many white and lettered ones are there? There's four out of the 10 total balls, right? Four, two, three, one. If I add them together, I get 10. There's only four of them are white, four of them are 11. WN, well, there's two of them out of 10, 0.2, six of them out of 10, four of them out of 10, and you can just go down the whole list. What's the probability of getting an L? Well, there's four and three, which makes it seven out of 10, or 0.7. What's the probability of getting an N? Um, it would be 2 and 1, which gives me 3 out of 10, etc. So when events are dependent, the urn contains 10 balls and two white balls, numbered N, four balls, white balls, lettered L, three yellow balls, etc. And you can see the probability of getting each one of these independent things. Now, the conditional probability that, a ball, that the ball drawn is lettered given that it is yellow. So we pull it out, we see the color, we know it's yellow. So what's the probability of it being lettered? Well, now we've changed the, the denominator a little bit. If we look at yellow ones, the probability of picking a yellow one, there's how many ways can we pick a yellow one? Four out of ten. And how many of those are actually lettered? Three out of four. So it's 0.75 divided by 0.4. What? Let's look at that. What's the probability of yellow, yellow and lettered? Three out of 10. What's the probability of just picking yellow? It's four out of 10. So it's really three out of four. We can verify this by using the joint probability formula. This is just a version of the joint probability formula, so I don't know what we're verifying. So if the stock market reaches 12,500 points by January, there is a 70% probability that tubeless electronics will go up. You believe there's only a 40% chance the market will reach 1250. Let M represent the event of the stock market reaching 1250. Let T be the event that tubeless goes up in value. So if we want to know M, T, 
It's t given m times the probability of m. What's the, prob the joint probability of both happening? Well, t given m is what? We said there's a 40% chance. There's a 70% chance that if the market hits that value, the tubeless electronics will go there. So there's 70 times the probability of the market hitting that, which is 0.4. So that comes out to be 0.4 times 0.28, or 28% chance of that happening. Uh, revising probabilities with what they call Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem is used to incorporate additional information to create posterior probabilities. What? Let's talk about what that is. Prior probabilities, new information, Bayes' process, posterior probabilities. A cup contains two dice, identical in appearance, but one is fair and one is unbiased. In other words, a loaded dice. Probability of rolling a 3 on the fair die is 1 sixth, or 0.166. Probability of tossing the same number on the loaded dice is 0.6. So it's a higher probability of getting a 3. We select 1 by chance, toss it, and get a 3. Now we ask the question, what is the probability that the die rolled was fair? What is the probability that the die rolled was unfair, the loaded die? This is the kind of stuff Bayesian looks at. Well, we know the probability of the die being fair or loaded is 0.5 and 0.5. There's only two dice in the thing. A probability of rolling a 3 giving that it's a fair dice is 0.166. The probability of rolling a 3 given it's loaded is 0.6. We compute the probabilities of 3 and fair and 3 and loaded. 3 and fair, we follow that probability law from a couple slides ago. This Bayes theorem right there. We follow, use one of these two. We're going to use this one. Three and fair, 0.166 times 0.5, 0 0.083. There's an 8% chance that if you that uh, the uh, if you, you have a three and fair dice of getting a three, uh, of, of uh, picking it and getting three and having it be a fair dice. The probability of picking one die and having it and rolling it and getting having it, uh, it outcome to be a three and the die is loaded is three given it's loaded is 0 0.6. Probability of picking the loaded one is 0 0.5, so I get 0 0.3. Now, how do I combine this to get the probability? How do I find the probability? The sum of these probabilities gives us an unconditional probability of tossing a 3. I right, add these two up. I can't pick the loaded dice and the unloaded and the fair die at the same time. So they're independent events, so, so I can add them. And I get 0.383. So now, if I... Flip it around. What's the probability of it being a fair die given that it's a 3? Well, I get fair and 3 divided by 3. What's the probability of it loaded given that I rolled a 3? Loaded and 3 divided by the probability of 3. So I take my probabilities that I just calculated in the previous one and divide them by 0.383 and get 0.22 and 0.78. Now, you've got to play with this a little bit yourself and convince yourself on how that's working. I'm dividing probabilities. But if you think about it, you know, I'm also dividing fractions. You'll see that the numerators probably cancel out. Okay, these are the revised and posterior or posterior probabilities for the next roll of the die. We use these to revise our prior probability estimates. I want to know the probability that it's loaded, given that I rolled a three. It says almost an eighty percent chance. What's the probability that it was a fair die that given that I rolled a three? Well, it's twenty percent chance. But look at, if I rolled a 60% chance of it getting a 3 on a roll of dice and only a 16% chance, so the probability shifted a little bit based on the 50-50 part. Okay, so Bayes calculations. We have two states of nature, A and not A. Uh, the probability of A is 1 minus the probability of not A. So 
here's the state of nature. B, given that A occurred, B, given that not A occurred, times the probability of A times the probability of not A. I get probability of B and A. That gives me the probability of B and A occurring and the probability of B and A occurring. This, I don't know why this is there. I wouldn't divide this by that. That's just giving us that probability. This piece B doesn't belong here. The posterior probability is B and A times the probability of B now. See? And B and A times the probability of, and not A, given the probability of B, gives us the probability of A given that B occurred and not A occurring given that B occurred. Whoa. Well, here, look at this. I think it's just a notation of where this probability is. That's all it is. There, it's not a division sign. That's where it comes from. Okay, so the general Bayes formula looks like this. The probability of A given B, and this is a little bit of a headache, is B over A. B given A times the probability of A divided by B given A times the probability of A plus the probability of B given not A times the probability of not A. A is the complement of event A. For example, if A is a fair die, A prime is a loaded die. This is basically what we did in a previous example. Probability of a fair die given that a three was rolled. You just take this previous formula, you decide what's A, B, and not A, and you fill in all the blanks and you get 0.22. I think that's a little hard to do sometimes. And sometimes doing it with a um, decision tree is easier. So further probability revisions. Uh, we can look at certain information by performing the experiment a second time. If you can afford it, perform experiments several times. Um, what do you mean afford it? Well, if you do something to destruction and it's a prototype and prototypes cost you thousands of dollars, um, your experiment, you have to pay attention to that and make sure that you don't waste too much money in trying to get information. We roll the die again and get a three. A probability is fair, the probability is loaded, it's 50%, 50%. Probability of three, getting two threes, given a fair die, and a probability of giving two threes, giving a loaded die. Well, I just multiply those two probabilities together because they're independent, the, in the, the rolls are independent, and I get 0 0.027.36. And there's the calculations you can look at. I don't think any of the problems are going to be quite this hard. Uh, so, further probability revisions. After the roll of the first die, probability that the die is fair is 0.22. The probability that the die is loaded is 0.78. After the second roll, in other words, we've arrived the experience, we've done it twice. I pull the die and I roll it twice and I get two threes. What's the probability that it's loaded or fair? The probability that the die is fair is 0.67. The probability that the die is loaded is 0.93. All right, so now we want to talk about random variables. Uh, the random variable in the paint was how many cans of paint we sell in a day. The choices were 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That was a random variable. A discrete random variable can only assume a finite or limited number of values. Uh, Continuous random variables can assume any one of an infinite set of values. Um, stock 50 Christmas trees. You have a stock of 50 Christmas trees, number of Christmas trees sold. It's a random variable and it's um, discrete. doesn't mean it can keep a good secret. It just means it's finite because you can have only 50 trees. Inspect 600 items, number of acceptable items. That's uh, also a random variable. It's discrete because it's, it has to be a number between 0 and 600. Uh, send out letters to 5,000 people, a number of people responding um, to the letters. Well, you send out 5,000 letters. 
you have some finite number of people between zero and 5,000 and it can only be whole numbers. So it's a finite number of responses and a finite number of possibilities. So it's a discrete variable. Build an apartment building, percent of building completed after four months. Well, depending on how many decimal places you want to get take that to, um, it's a continuous variables because it's between zero and 100 and it could be any of the infinite number of numbers in between those two. Uh, testing the light time of a light bulb in minutes. And if you allow minutes, you know, use a stopwatch and can measure minutes to the thousandth uh, minute or further, it's between zero and 80,000. The length of time the bulb lasts up to 80,000 minutes. Well, that's a continuous variable because you could have any number between zero and 80,000 limited only by your measurement device. Uh, random variables that are not measured, that are not numbers, strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. You can assign numbers to them. It's almost like if you get an A, B, C, D, or F, you assign four for an A, three for B, and you've obviously, you've changed a, not, a, a alphabetic or categorical um, variable into a numeric variable and then you can calculate things like I don't know grade point average which we do all the time uh, one machine is uh, inspected the, the, the good is defective it's not defective you could assign number zero and one to that uh, customers respond to how they like a product good average poor you could assign numbers three to one to that for discrete random variables uh, probabilities assigned to each event the students in Pat Shannon's statistics class have just completed a quiz of five algebra problems. The distribution of correct scores is given in the following table. There was five, so you either get five right, four right, three right, two right, one right, and they have the number of students out of 100 students in their classes that did it, and you can compute these probabilities, just like we did with the latex paint. You can draw it in the histogram which is always a good thing to do. The central tendency of the distribution is the mean or expected value. The amount of variability is called the variance. We want to look at spread and what's the range of the data and what's or the dispersion of the data and the central tendency. We tend to use mean and standard deviation because the normal distribution has two parameters, mean and standard deviation. That's why we use standard deviation. Other than that, Range is a much better measure, more intuitive measure of central tendency. How do you calculate the expected value or the mean? Well, the sigma sign means you start with the first one, x1 times the probability of that occurring. And then sigma means then write a plus sign, then index that to 2, and x2 times the probability of 2 occurring plus x3 times probability of 3 occurring, and you continue that until you get to n, which is the number of your sample. And you can read it down there below. So for Shannon's class, Dr. Shannon's class, we have 5 times 0.1, 4 times 0.2, 3 times 0.3, 2 times 0.3, and 1 times 0.1. We add those all up, and the average score was 2.9 out of 5 correct. The variance is a little different. It's xi minus the expected value times the probability. And you could read it here, but look at it in a very simple example. Remember, this was always 2.9. So we say, how far away from 2.9 is it? And what's the probability of that occurring? The reason statisticians square it is because they don't want to have negative numbers. They want to find the dispersion without knowing if it's plus or minus. So the standard deviation comes out to be 1.29, which doesn't mean much. The standard deviation is a square root of the variance. It's that simple. So if the variance was 129, the square root of that is 1.14. That becomes a standard deviation. You can calculate, put these in a table. Here's 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Here's the probabilities. Here's the A times B, which gives you the uh, X times PX. And then you sum that up. That will give you the mean. 
And then here's D, which is you're calculating A2. Now, they put dollar signs around the C. Why did they do that? Because they want C7, which is this number here, the, the expected value to be fixed. That won't change. That won't index as this changes. They square it and multiply it times B2, which is the probability. And then they add that up. It becomes the variance. And if they take the square root, it becomes the standard deviation. That's what it looks like after you do the calculations. When you do your homework for me, I want you to do your calculations in Excel. I do not want you to do the calculations elsewhere and just type the numbers in Excel. What a waste. Excel is a wonderful calculator. I, will give, I won't give you credit if you do not do your calculations in Excel. And if you don't know Excel, this is a good time to learn it. OK. The probability distribution of a continuous random variable. Well, we're going to talk about that. We're just going to, this is the end of part one. Since random variables can take an infinite number, we have to look at a range. The probability of any specific value is zero. The probability, so we look at the probability of it between, being between one value and another value, the probability of it being greater than a value or less than a value. And if you look at a curve like this, we want to find out uh, this is the weight in grams of some like ball bearing, perhaps. And we want to find out what's the probability that these seemingly identical ball bearings weigh between 5.22 grams and 5.26 grams. So next, we're going to do the binomial distribution and the normal distribution parts of this presentation. That will be part two. Thank you very much for your attention, and we'll talk again soon.